Hi, welcome back to a new video. I promised you on Thursday that we will have another video about the 14900KS because one might be insane enough to actually order one of these CPUs. And in that case, cooling is very important. That's why we will today first look at custom water cooling with a solid water block and then delete the CPU and use this new direct dye water cooling block. First, we will test with AlphaCool's Core 1, simply because I tested it multiple times before and I know it has a solid performance. We are always testing with the same fixed pump speed and in this case it's about 150 liters per hour. The CPU is fully running a default, only XMP is enabled and we will now run our 23 look at a power consumption, which is going to be insane. We see 394 in the German take, which I just shot, we had 418 peak, which is definitely a lot more than what the AIO was capable of dissipating, which is also why the CPU is now constantly running at a higher clock and thus results in a higher performance overall, simply because it's water cooled. We can see 40,200 points and you have to keep in mind that due to the hardware info monitoring in the background, you can see in the task manager, yeah, it's stealing between one and 3% in performance. That's what you have to keep in mind. So if I would close hardware info and run again, it's going to be higher. And I will now run five times and we will compare with our AIO results. In this chart, we can see five consecutive Cinebench R23 runs that you also saw in the previous video. In blue, it's the 4900K, average 39,600 points. Yellow, the 4900KS, cooled by a normal 360 AIO. If we look at the trend line again, you can see with AIO cooling, it is slowly decreasing, simply because the AIO cannot keep up with the high heat load and thus the CPU is not able to keep the clock at the same level. Now in green, you can see the custom water cooling with Mora, which is a lot of surface area and allows to dissipate all of the heat. On average, it's 40,700 points and it's always steady in performance. With AIO, we were at 40,400 points and declining. If we run this setting through R23, we see the clock is now stable at 5.8. Temperature wise, it's on a limit. One core sitting like 94 degrees Celsius, 95 here. CPU package power, peaks out at around 370 watt, which is lower than keeping the CPU stock in auto. At the same time, you can see that the multi-core score is a little bit higher. And that's simply because the clock is more stable at always 5.8. The 5.8 gigahertz are done by setting the performance core ratio to sync all cores, 58 on the all core ratio limit. In the Digi Plus VRM, I changed the CPU load line calibration to level five, which is a little bit higher than usual. Level six will cause the CPU to be much warmer. So that's something I would not recommend. But with level four, the, yeah, the V-core drops down too low. So it's getting unstable. CPU current capability is set to 140% and manual voltage on the cores. And the manual voltage is set to 1.46, which drops down lower under load, but it's still fairly high. But I will show you even if we put this now to 1.5, and change all core ratio limit to 59, it's not gonna work. As expected, this is a high idle voltage and that's caused by the settings we did in BIOS, but it's also very similar to what you get on auto with this CPU, only that it doesn't yeah, lower the voltage right now due to the manual setting. Now running the 5.9 gigahertz, it is hitting the thermal limit. So we're approaching the 100 degrees Celsius, which means there is no more headroom for us to increase the voltage even further. And as you can also see, it's not stable. So yeah, that's, that's the edge for this CPU with a normal cooling solution. Okay, now it's time to delete the KS CPU. Even though this is a 14th gen CPU, you all know that it's identical to the 13th gen. That's why we can just use the 13th gen delete die mate, which will also be in stock again very soon. That looks good. Still sitting on tighter than expected, so I have to pull a few more millimeters. Feels better now. We won't need the IHS anymore, but we have to clean the CPU all the way, remove the glue and also the indium. We also experimented quite a lot to find a way to safely remove the glue on the CPU, and we came up with this solution. Those are laser cut acrylic pieces, and they have sharp edges. So for example, the sharp edge on front and also sharp edges on the side, but it's still not sharp enough to damage the PCB. It's definitely quite convenient. As you can see, it's pretty quick and easy with the sharp acrylic edge. 
And with the tiny sharp thing in front, you can also more precisely remove the, the area around the SMD caps without damaging them. But you have to be very careful in this area not to break them off. Removed all the glues. You might still see some kind of residues if you tilt it, but that's definitely clean enough. And even to remove the indium solder, as you can see, you can use the sharp edge of the acrylic to scrape off the majority of the indium. And now that we scraped off the majority of the indium solder, I'm going to apply Conduct Node Extreme liquid metal compound, which consists of gallium and indium. And with the gallium and indium alloy sitting on top here, it will take off uh, yeah, the remaining maybe 90% of the indium from the dye. You just have to wait like 15 or 20 minutes. In that case, I'm using plenty of liquid metal just to make sure there is enough gallium to eat up the remaining indium, making sure that everything is covered, every edge, every corner. And now just going to wait 15 minutes. After about 5 to 10 minutes, I would recommend that you just swipe across the entire surface. You will notice that it now feels a lot smoother than before. And this will help getting off most of the indium. Now we take a piece of cloth, I applied some cleaning alcohol on there, which will make the cleaning a lot easier. You can also use acetone or something similar if you want to. And just with two wipes, it already looks pretty good. In this clean state, you could put the CPU back into the socket, apply liquid metal and then mount the direct dye cooler. But there are some people who would like to see the dye even cleaner than that. There are multiple ways to do it. You can use some kind of polish. I've seen plenty of people doing that with different kind of polishes. But there's also an easy trick that you can do at home without buying an extra polish. First I'm taping my CPU to the desk. You can use any kind of tape you want, insulation tape, captain tape, whatever you have laying around. And the reason is to fix the CPU and also protect the SMDs. And on this we will apply a good amount of thermal paste. And even though I just use Cryonaut Extreme, I would definitely recommend not to use it for this application because it's way too expensive for that. But you might have some other thermal compound laying at home. Sometimes you have something that was included in some kind of cooler or AIO, some kind of small syringe you didn't use. But inside thermal paste, you typically have metal oxides like aluminum oxide, zinc oxide, which are very abrasive and are perfect to use as polish. And now you just take a cloth and rub across. And you can straight see the effect already on the cloth. It didn't even take a minute. You can obviously clean it more if you want to, but that should be fine. I'm not just going to clean the CPU. Wipe the cross with some alcohol again. Looks very good to me. And it didn't even take five minutes. Now it's time to use the direct dye water cooling block. And I announced this already a long time ago. And honestly, we had quite some trouble getting this to work reliably, especially yeah, with the contact pressure into the socket. It was not so easy to make sure that the memory frequency does not get hurt by using the direct dye water block to get the pressure right. But now we're pretty confident. Everything looks very good and it's already in mass production. There will be two versions and obviously the retail version will also be with nickel plating on the bottom and not the bare copper, but you can see it's one of the coolers we've been using before for our evaluation and testing. I will have to remove the stock ILM first. I already put the CPU in the socket simply to replace it sometimes. Yeah, I accidentally dropped the CPU into the socket maybe damaged it, so this way it should be more secure and, and I'm also trying to not damage the CPU, obviously. Already applied liquid metal to the base of the cooler. It's also important not to tighten this cooler too much. You will always see a gap between the motherboard and the cooler. That is intended because the cooler sits on top of the plastic socket and not on the motherboard, simply to leave a little bit more air in between there because from our testing seems to be beneficial because you have the mainboard uh, memory traces right here and if we have more space in between there for insulation the signaling quality is just getting better. Quick check to see if everything boots. Very good. That seems to be okay. The flow speed with this cooler, same pump speed, is 172 liters per hour whereas we had about 150 with the core one. 
That is intended, again, simply because you can use this cooler with a lower pump speed and still get a very high flow and performance. It's not very restrictive. I reloaded the same profile, 5.8 gigahertz, the same V-core on the CPU. And we can also see 7,400 megahertz on the memory. So again, that's also the same. I'm just going to rerun R23, but it's insane. The performance and temperature difference, just look at this. It is so much lower on the P cores. Also CPU package power is a lot lower. I think it's maybe 20 or 30 watt difference simply because the CPU stays so much, so much colder. Still steady 5.8. Yeah, that's insane. I'm going to record a few runs and then do evaluation. In this chart, we can see both temperatures and power consumption of three consecutive Cinebench R23 runs. With the Alpha Cool Core 1, the average peak core temperature was 87 degrees Celsius, and with the Thermal Grizzly Micro Direct Eye, on average 74 degrees Celsius. That is an improvement of 13 degrees Celsius with the exact same settings. And in addition, the water temperature was slightly higher with the Micro Direct Eye run by about 0.8 degrees Celsius. With the dotted line underneath, you can see the power consumption of the CPU under load. It's quite hard to see a difference within this chart, so I calculated the difference. On average, it was 321 watt with the Core 1 and 309 with the Micro. This equals in a reduced power consumption of 12 watt due to the lower temperature. I'm pretty sure you remember that we just tried 5.9 GHz with the Alpha Cool Core 1, which did not work with the stock IHS and normal cooling solution. And now with direct die, we will try 6 GHz at 1.525 volt. That voltage is going to be insane, but it's going to be needed to run 6 GHz. And now with this setting, we are able to run 6 GHz without any kind of extreme cooling, of course. The CPU core temperature is rather high, but that is caused by the high V core that is needed to pass the 6 GHz on these CPU cores. CPU package power is at about 375 watt peak. Without Hardware Info running in the background, this way we can achieve 42,600 points. I still find it impressive what kind of temperature improvement is possible on these CPUs, especially if you consider that these are soldered CPUs and looking back when the CPU used polymer tim would have been a lot worse. The Micro Direct Die will be available in two versions again. We will start with the POM version as a basic version and then later on there will be an RGB version which also will feature a slightly better cold plate, so a few degrees Celsius, maybe one and a half, two degrees Celsius better and that will be slightly more expensive. This one, target MSRP, if everything works out, will be $99 and the RGB version probably around $140. We also learned from the mistakes from the past from the AMD Direct Eye block that we will only list it once we have plenty of stock available, which will hopefully be in about two to three weeks. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.